All right, so I will give formal definitions of quill varieties uh, and then discuss an example and prove, try to prove one theorem. Uh, okay, so first of all, I, I remind you about stability. Just very quickly. So suppose we have a reductive group. Uh, group uh, acting on some affine variety. Affine. Uh, and we would like to, uh, to define a GIT quotient. So we fix uh, a character, a one dimensional character of this group. Uh, so a character. Uh, and then one defines, uh, so one looks at the coordinate ring of x, and one defines chi semi-invariance, semi so these are functions on x which transform according to this character. Oops. Uh, I don't know how to write with this guy. Yeah. Now, of course, you can do also, you can look at the character chi to the n for any integer n. And this is also a character. And then we, you define a graded associative algebra, A sub chi, to be uh, the direct sum over on non-negative n's of uh, uh, semi-invariance of uh, weight chi to the n. So this is a Z, Z plus graded algebra. And then a standard algebraic geometry tells us that whenever you have a graded, non-negatively graded algebra, there is a scheme associated to this, which is called proj. And so one defines uh, x double slash g with sub i to be proj uh, of this graded algebra. And this is called a GIT quotient of x by g with respect to chi. Uh, so in the case where, a uh, special case where, uh, where chi is 1, uh, so this becomes just the usual uh, 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 categorical quotient. So this is just x double slash g, which is just spectrum of the algebra of invariance. Uh, so this is affine. Uh, this one is not necessarily affine, and moreover, there is a canonical map pi uh, from x double slash chi g to uh, x double slash g. Uh, so this is a canonical projective uh, morphism. Okay, so this is a general uh, GIT reminder. So now we want to apply it to our quiver, quiver setting. So this goes as follows. Uh, so first of all, there will be no quiver, just a finite set, which will be later going to be the set of vertices. Uh, then for each uh, i in i, we assign a, a finite dimensional vector space. And I call this I tuple by just single V. So we consider, as in the previous time, our group will be G sub V, which will be direct product of GLs of all these vector spaces. Uh, OK, so it's Lie algebra is obviously uh, so German G sub V, which is a direct sum of general linear just matrices of on vector spaces VI. So we are interested in taking GIT quotients with respect to this group G sub V. So we want to look at the characters chi for this group. So we want to look, so all characters are, you know, so all possible characters are denoted by G sub V uh, home to C star. And so how do they look like? Uh, well, a character, so this is a product of GLs. So the character looks like a map from the product of GL, VI, 
to C star. And any such character has the following form and takes an I tuple of uh, invertible matrices and takes it to the product of determinants of these matrices. And each determinant can be raised to some integer power, chi i. So this is a general way how a character can look like. And so we see that the set of all such characters is identified uh, to z, to the i tuples of integers, chi sub i. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, of these i tuples, uh, chi sub i in z. So one integer for each, z, uh, for each i. And sometimes I will identify, uh, so instead of, uh, I will write chi both for, the, for a character and for the corresponding i tuple of integers. Okay, so now we also, also want, since we want to go uh, to use the moment map, we need to figure out what the moment, at least where does it go. Uh, and the moment map goes uh, into the dual of the Lie algebra. So we want to look, and we want to not just in R, so we want to first of all to look at uh, G, upper star, G sub V upper star, but actually we want to look, uh, remember the moment map is supposed to be G equivariant, and actually we were in, only interested in, in the points here which are fixed by G. So we, we are only interested in, in this set. So in other words, what does this mean? We mean uh, this means that we are looking at linear functions on this. So linear functions from direct sum of GL VI to C, which are conjugation invariant. And of course, a conjugation invariant function on, on matrices is the trace. That's the only function. So any such character looks as follows. It takes an I tuple of matrices and sends them to a linear combination, uh, sum lambda i, trace ui. And so they see that all such guys are uh, form c to the i. So now lambdas are arbitrary complex numbers, not necessarily integer or anything. Uh, and so this c to the i has coordinates uh, lambda i. So, uh, so the character, uh, so such a character is identified with an i tuple. And again, I will I, I use, uh, often identify the linear map with the corresponding i tuple. So I will just write lambda both for the map and for the labeling set of the i tuple. All right, so now we actually have to, uh, uh, to work with a quiver. Uh, so uh, we have a quiver, Q, a quiver. Uh, and so with uh, uh, the vertex set i, as before. Uh, OK, so now for this, I, uh, in, in order to study the moment map, it's convenient to introduce another quiver, which is called the opposite, which has all, its, all the arrows of the original quiver reversed. So whenever I have a, an edge, uh, edge, Uh, x in Q. So this quiver has uh, a reverse edge, which will be denoted by x star. So by definition, every edge of the original quiver corresponds to an edge in the opposite direction. So if this edge goes from i to j, then this edge goes from j to i. And the vertices are the same. And finally, the quiver, which is really important, is the double. Uh, which, well, somewhat imprecisely, I can write it as a union of Q and Q opposite in the sense that uh, the vertices are the same as in Q and Q opposite, but you, you take arrows both in both directions, so the arrows are both x's and x stars. So double of Q. And now you observe that, uh, first of all, you observe that uh, if, you, if I'm taking representations of my Q in some vector space V, uh, so this is a vector space, as we know. So it's a, some, actually it's a, so it's a product of homes over edges of home VI into home VJ for all edges I from I to J, right? And so the dual space can be identified with the homes in the opposite direction. 
but the homs in the opposite direction corresponds to the homs for the opposite quiver, right? So we have that uh, wrap uh, Q uh, V star is identified with wrap uh, Q opposite V because it's, it's a similar uh, bunch of homes, but now from Vj to Vi. And therefore, the cotangent bundle uh, to wrap Qv, uh, well, since wrap Qv is a vector space, the cotangent bundle is simply this space times its dual. And therefore, you have to take this times this. And uh, this is precisely the same as wrap of these two together, which is Q bar. So this cotangent bundle, so let me write it. So it's wrap Q V times wrap uh, Q opposite V. And this is the same as wrap uh, Q bar V. OK, so this is what uh, we're supposed to do. So now we have to study the moment map. So with respect to our action. So the group GV acts on everything here in the obvious way. So we have the moment map uh, mu from uh, T star uh, wrap uh, Q V, which is the same as, as we just discussed as wrap. Yeah, so maybe I should write it, first of all, uh, the way it, it should be. So it's just a co from the cotangent bundle to the dual of the Lie algebra, like this. But now it's convenient to, first of all, identify the left-hand side, as I just did with wrap uh, Q bar V, and to identify this G star with G itself using the trace. Basically, we also did the same here when we identified with the, this with this, we also use the trace. We identify the dual from home V to home Vj, from one V to another V with home from in the opposite direction, and that involves the trace. Uh, so we identify this with this, and this with this. So trace here and trace here. And then a little uh, lemma says that, uh, so on this, at this level, uh, so this map, I will still denote it by mu, uh, is that has the following form. So has form. Uh, so if I have a collection of edges of, of arrows, I mean of linear maps corresponding to arrows, x uh, from q, and then it, since I'm in q bar, I also have linear maps corresponding to all reverse edges uh, in q opposite. And so out of this data, I'm supposed to cook up a matrix. And the matrix is uh, given as follows. So each linear map, so this goes from i to j, for instance. And then this goes from j to i. And so if I compose them in either direction, I, I get a map from a vector space to itself. Okay? And so, uh, what, so what I'm writing at the moment is a little bit formal. So you write a formal commutator, x, uh, x times x star minus x star times x. So it's the commutator over all x, edges, edge, edge of q. Now, uh, this is a very nice, convenient way to write it, but what this really means is that so it's not clear where does it live. So it's supposed to live in here, which is a direct sum of GLVI for over all i. Now, if you really want to see, so it's supposed to be one matrix for each i. Now, so what this really means for, so for, for, for each i in i, so the corresponding thing here, so I will write it as sum x, commutator x star, and then all of it sub i. So this is the component in i that I'm supposed to write. So what you have to do, you have to pick uh, all the, uh, let's say, edges x star, which, which uh, are uh, going out of the vertex i. So you're taking uh, all axes. Uh, x stars, which are going, uh, so, out i, 
And then the corresponding x is the reverse edge, so it's incoming to i. Uh, x uh, in i. So, and all, so you take the sum of all these guys over all edges with this property, and then you subtract uh, the sum, a similar sum, where you first take all the axes which go out of i, and those x stars which go back. So, so the axes in, in, in appearing in this sum are different from the axes appearing in this sum. You're taking the different ones. Uh, so these are the axes uh, out of i. And this is the x stars, then, which are in i. So it's a bunch of matrices from vi to itself. And this is another bunch of matrices from vi to itself. You subtract them. OK? Uh, all right. So, uh, so uh, I will, I mean, since this is a very crucial computation, I will work it out. I will prove this lemma in a simple case. And actually, the proof in the general case is exactly the same, except that you put i's everywhere. Uh, so let's consider a basic case of uh, the Jordan quiver, uh, which is a quiver with one vertex and one loop at this vertex. So it's a kind of weird quiver. So Jordan uh, quiver. Uh, so it's just this. So this is x, and this is my quiver. So just one ver vertex and one edge. So the double q bar, it looks, so we have to double the, the edges and put them in reverse direction. But of course, for a loop, this is nothing reverse. You can, you can write it in reverse, that it's still a loop. So you have an, one loop, which is called x, and the other loop, which is called x star. So you can put arrows w whatever way you like. It's still one dual to the other. Uh, all right. So, uh, so now I'm looking at the so dimension is now just one integer, uh, the dimension of the, vertex of, of the vector space at that, at that vertex. Uh, so uh, representations of dimension n, uh, of, uh, which means the representations in the vector space c to the n, uh, maybe I should write, and of the original of uh, q bar, is just a pair of matrices, a pair of linear maps from C to the N to itself, without any conditions. Uh, it's just uh, uh, GLV times GLV. Uh, OK. Uh, so uh, um, the moment map is supposed to be a map from this gadget uh, to GLV. So, But remember that uh, it actually in go, should, should go in GLV star, which I identify with GLV using the trace. So let's do this. Let's first put a star, and then at the end, we'll identify it with S. OK, so now uh, if, you look, if you remember the definition, so, okay, so now let's take uh, a pair. So we take an element in here, which is one linear map, which is x, and another linear map, which is x star. So this is a point in here x, x star. Okay. So what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to take, uh, compute the value of the moment map at this pair. And if you look at the definition of the moment map, uh, the definition is this. Uh, so, right, and so there's also, yes. So and also here, uh, remember that when we look at, the, at q bar, so the point is that the, the opposite part was identified with the dual of the original part of Q. So in fact, in, in, these two GLs are also dual to each other, again, using the trace form. All right. So, uh, OK. So, so this is supposed to be, at, at any rate, it's supposed to be a linear map from GLV to, to scalars. So it's supposed to be a linear map, which takes a matrix and sends it to a number. So what is this number? If you look at the definition, the number is this. You take x star, but think of it as a, as a dual to matrices. Okay? And you have to pair this x star with the adjoint action 
of u. So this u is thought of as, is an element of the Lie algebra. So it acts on the, on the matrix by the adjoint action, which is the commutator. And this has to be applied to, to x. So this is the, what the definition, the general definition tells you. Okay, now let's write it out. Uh, uh, well, the pairing is the trace. We just, we, we just said this. So if you think of X star as an actual matrix, what you, instead of the angle brackets, you have to put the trace and take the product. And now the adjoint action is just the commutator. Right? So this is just uh, uh, the commutator, UX. And so what we are supposed to do is compute this. Right? But the basic property of the trace, this is an expression which always shows up when you study Killing form in the Lie algebra. And so uh, the point is that uh, the trace is cyclically symmetric. And so uh, if, you, uh, if you write it and move it in a cyclic way, uh, you will get, so now what, which way do I want it to move? So it will, it's the same as the trace of uh, u times x star x. So maybe there was some sign which I... Uh, Somehow, well, okay. So now this is uh, this is the linear map. So yeah. So so if I put equality, so this is the linear map which sends this to this, and this is the linear map which sends this to this. But now we have identified. So this we do the last step. We have to identify a linear function on G L with an element of G L itself, right? Now, here is a linear function, and how do we identify with an element? Uh, we, it's the linear function has the form u goes to u times something, trace of u. So the element which in GL which corresponds to it, it's whatever's standing here, and this is the commutator. Right? So we see that the map is actually given x, x star. Uh, it goes to the bracket x, x star. And this is a special case of, uh, of this formula here. So you do exactly the same argument for the general quiver, and you come out with, uh, uh, with this. All right. Uh, right, and so now, uh, the, the uh, preliminary, well, somehow, uh, uh, first definition. So, definition. So given a quiver, a quiver uh, Q and it, uh, the, a vector space, finite dimensional vector space uh, V, and also given parameters uh, chi is chi, an i-tuple of integers, and another i-tuple lambda, lambda psi i of complex numbers. Uh, uh, we define the quiver variety. Uh, so now how do I define it? How do I denote it? So it's a uh, chi, sub chi, sub lambda of Q V to be, uh, so you take the fiber of the moment map over lambda, which is a linear function in the target of the moment map. And then you take GIT quotient with respect to the character chi in the sense I just explained a few minutes ago, uh, uh, by the group G sub V. Okay. So, so this is a quiver variety. Okay, so now let's look at a basic example, the same we, we actually worked out here. So look, let's look at an example to see that uh, there is no, uh, this definition is no good. Okay, so now we look at this Jordan quiver. And so uh, each of these parameters, so this is just one integer. Uh, chi, and this is one complex number lambda. And so what we're interested in is M sub chi lambda uh, of this quiver, just with one loop, at some vector space V. 
But now there's a problem. Uh, the problem is, uh, so the moment map, we just computed it. It's the map which takes x, uh, right, so, right. So let's, let's write down what, uh, what we're doing. So before I write this, let me write down. So the moment map is, I just uh, described it. So this is a map from GLN, GLV times GLV uh, to GLV, which takes x, x star to the commutator. But uh, we are only taking the pre-images of scalar matrices, because we're taking lambda is a point, uh, well, uh, lambda was uh, somewhere here. So it's a linear combination of traces. When I identify uh, linear functions with elements of GL, trace corresponds to the scalar matrix. So we're taking here lambda, which is sum of lambda i, identity, in general, identity vi. Now, in our case, there's only one v. So uh, we are just taking lambda, which is this, there's no sum. So lambda is the same as lambda times identity, where lambda is a complex num number. But then, unfortunately, if you try to solve the equation that x bracket x star is equal to lambda identity, this equation has no solution unless lambda is 0, because the trace uh, of commutator is 0. So uh, mu inverse of lambda is the set of x x star such that uh, the commutator of x x star is equal to lambda times identity. And this space is empty unless lambda is 0. And for the same reason, if chi is not trivial, again, uh, we'd get an empty set. So this set is empty uh, if uh, either uh, lambda is not 0 or chi is not 0. Well, and if uh, so both of these guys are 0, so what happens? Well, looking at uh, so the pre the inver so mu inverse of zero is simply the pair uh, arbitrary pairs of commuting matrices. So just x and x star which commute. So this is a commuting variety. And so what we have, uh, so this is supposed to be a quotient of the commuting variety mod the action. And since our character is trivial, this is a categorical quotient, right? So this variety is a commuting variety. Uh, double slash without any chi, because chi is 0. Uh, GLV. Now, uh, so what is it? Uh, now, I, I just tell you the answer, and you can figure out that this is correct. So what you do, you take two commuting matrices, and somehow you want to look at them mod simultaneous conjugation. So the only invariant you have is uh, 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 simultaneous eigenvalues of both matrices. So there's an n-tuple of eigenvalues of the first matrix, and n-tuple of Since they commute, you can simultaneously put them in an upper triangular form, so they're uh, well-defined tuples of eigenvalues. And uh, these are up to simultaneous permutation of coordinates, of course. I mean, the n-tuple of eigenvalues is only uh, well-defined up, uh, up to permutation. But now you permute them simultaneously because you put them in triangular form simultaneously. So uh, the answer is uh, c to the n, which is one n-tuple, times another c to the n, which is another n-tuple, and mod the permutation action of Sn. So that's the answer. Or you can also... If you like, rewrite this as you first take the pair of the first eigenvalue of both matrices and then the second pair. And so you can, re this is the same as sim n. Uh, well, I can write it this way. It's c2 to the n. c2 to the n mod sn. cn to the 2 is the same as c2 to the n. Uh, but notice that in this calculation, we were forced, we couldn't take a non-trivial character. So in a sense, all this GIT stuff that I explained was completely irrelevant. I never used it, and I couldn't use it for the reason that uh, something has to be a scalar and uh, nothing happened. So, so the upshot of this discussion is that, uh, that, well, this is the answer, but the point is that the commuting variety is an extremely singular thing. 
So you cannot possibly get a nice quotient. Well, this categorical quotient is turned, it's also singular, actually. Uh, but so somehow we didn't use GIT. Let me work out one more example, which is slightly more general. Uh, and which sort of relates, well, since this is a kind of Langlands conference, I have to relate it to Langland somewhere. So, uh, so here is one little relation, which is in the very close to what Olivier was uh, talking yesterday. So let's uh, take the falling quiver, still one vertex, but now put G loops at this vertex. Uh, so G loops. So this is my Q. Let's call the loops x1 up to x sub g. Uh, so the double will have uh, uh, two g loops at the same vertex, which will, uh, I will denote instead of stars, I will write y. So there will be additional loops, uh, well, maybe opposite. Uh, this will be exact same quiver, uh, but now the loops are denoted by y, y, y1 and uh, y sub g. Uh, now the moment map takes all these things, so my map mu uh, will look as a map which takes my uh, tuple xi and my tuple yi. And remember the formula, you have to take commutators and sum over the vertices. So this will be, in this case, simply, uh, well, i is not the right thing. It's i is the, the vertex is just one. So uh, I don't know. I will just write explicitly. x1, x sub g, y1, y sub g. And all this goes to uh, x1 bracket y1 plus, plus x, xg bracket yg. So this is what the moment map does. Uh, again, we are supposed to take the fiber over some scalar matrix. For the same reason, the scalar has to be 0, because uh, the trace of this expression is 0. So we can, the only thing we can do is to look at the inverse image of, of 0. And this is the set of two G tuples of matrices with a condition that this is 0. So So such tuples of matrices, so GLN uh, to the 2G, such that this expression is 0, sum of x mm, alpha y alpha is 0. Uh, now, the reason I put, uh, so the, the link with this uh, Langland stuff uh, uh, comes as in, from the following observation that suppose I have a curve of genus G, an arbitrary curve of genus G. Well, a, a compact, so a closed curve. So let uh, C be a smooth Riemann surface. of genus G, then the pi 1 of this surface, the fundamental group has uh, 2G generators. So it has generators uh, A1, A sub G, and B1, so the A cycles and B cycles, uh, with, the re with the relation that the product of group commutators A alpha B alpha is 1. Now, the point is that the equation we are looking at here is sort of additive version of this. So here we have invertible matrices satisfying the equation that the product of group commutators is 1. And here we are looking at arbitrary matrices. And the equation is the sum of the co Lie algebra commutators is 1. So you can say that uh, so a representation of the fundamental group is the same. So wrap. Uh, n of pi 1 uh, is uh, of C. You can think of it as uh, rank n local systems on the curve. So it's the same as rank n 
local systems on C, uh, on, on, on the curve. And so what we're doing here is sort of in additive version, you can think of it as a tangent space at the trivial representation to this real thing. So what we're looking at the tangent space at the trivial representation uh, to this, which is the same as the tangent space to the trivial representation to this. Uh, and uh, this is precisely the fiber of the moment map, but I made a mistake. And the mistake is that when I'm looking at, uh, when I write rep of the fundamental group, again, I will take reps up to isomorphism. So the corresponding tuple, I mean, the corresponding tuples of matrices are taken up to conjugation. So actually, and the same here, if I write a local system, it's up to isomorphism. It, I don't fix a basis in the space. So actually, you know, if, in order to write the equality, I have to, have to mod out by, uh, by this uh, ambiguity, and then it becomes a true equality. Uh, so the, I, I, I mod out by this GLN, and then it becomes precisely what uh, this Q variety is. So, so this is by definition M uh, zero, well, how do I define M C N? So this uh, quiver, so this is my quiver Q. So M Q C to the N uh, zero. So all these spaces are extremely uh, singular. So when I write tangent space, it's really some sort of, well, it's probably a risky tangent, but it has no connection to reality somehow. It's, uh, it's uh, some very good, bad, uh, badly behaved space. Okay, now, uh, right, so, so this was the definite, I mean, the thing I defined is quiver variety. Now we go to Nakajima quiver variety, which is something which is slightly different from this, but which behaves much better. So uh, this goes as follows. So we slightly change uh, the quiver. So first of all, we introduce a sort of notational thing. So given a quiver uh, Q, we define another quiver, which I'll denote by Q prime. And this is called the frame quiver. Uh, so this is the defined as follows. Uh, I will not write it in words, I just draw a picture. So this is my quiver, oh, maybe uh, something like this is my Q. So the, uh, the rule is as follows. For every vertex of the original quiver, I join a new vertex, just a pair to it, which, so if this is vertex i, I also introduce another vertex which is called i prime. If I have another vertex here, j, then I add a new vertex, j prime. <coughs> and then no matter how many edges I have with my original quiver, I add just a single arrow from each new vertex to the corresponding old vertex. So no matter whatever stands here, it, it, it doesn't play any role. I just add one edge from the, the new one to the old one, and then from here to here, and so on. This is called uh, Q prime. And now what the quiver, I, I, so this is a Q prime altogether. So the number of, ver so the collection of vertices is, uh, the set of original vertices doubled. So the original collection and the prime collection, okay? And so the quiver I want to uh, look at is, well, uh, the, 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 the quiver variety I want to look at is the following. I take a cotangent bundle to representations uh, of uh, the new quiver. But now to define a representation of a new quiver, I have to give you two tuples of vector spaces, one tuple corresponding to the original vertices and another tuple corresponding to the new vertices. So this, the, ver uh, the tuples corresponding to the original vertices are still denoted by V, and the new uh, tuple of vector spaces is denoted by W. That's the original Nakajima notation. So I uh, look at representations of Q prime bar in the vector spaces V and W. But the point, I mean, if, if uh, I, I just continue in the way I did, 
that would be the whole original story, but for a new quiver. So you won't get anything really new. But the point is that now you, uh, the group you are in, which acts on this gadget is only GLV corresponding to the old vertices. Although you also have GLW sitting on the new vertices, you, you forget about it. Okay, just, just don't touch it. Okay, so this is a, there's a group uh, G sub V acting on it. There's also G sub W, forget about it. So in particular, we have the moment map uh, to the same Lie algebra as before, namely G uh, Lie, Lie G sub V without any W. So G double twice, uh, Yes, thank you. So we did do the same thing as before, except that we don't touch, we don't do anything at the new vertices, although we do have vector spaces at them, and we do have linear map corresponding to the edges. So this is uh, the moment map. And then we just define, well, there's, then there's no uh, change. Then we define the Nakajima quiver variety as, uh, as simply, uh, so again, we have parameters uh, chi and lambda as before. There's no change to it. These correspond to, to a point in here and the character of the group GV. So there's no change in the group and the Lie algebra. But now we, we take, uh, so we have these uh, doubled vertices and, double, and the additional arrows. So this is denoted by in this way. So this is, again, mu uh, inverse of lambda double slash uh, chi g sub v. So the, all the formulas are the same except that uh, now the space, uh, oh, the, spa uh, the, uh, the quiver is changed, but the group is not. Okay. Well, uh, so I didn't say it in general, uh, but uh, uh, there is a more so. So all these spaces are de defined using GIT. But uh, uh, so GIT is, was defined uh, as a proj. But in fact, there's a description of what a point of that proj is. And this is uh, this description, uh, uh, the proof of this description is using what's called Hilbert Mumford criterion. So I just give you the answer in this case. So, uh, so Hilbert Mumford. Uh, say, uh, imply the following. Uh, yeah, so first of all, let me maybe uh, introduce the following set uh, before I uh, say Hilbert Mumford. So let me introduce the following set. So, uh, so what is a point in wrap uh, uh, Q prime bar VW? So how does a point in this guy look like? First of all, uh, you still have a representation of the original quiver without forgetting about all new additional stuff. And this gives me some linear maps x and some bunch of linear maps x star. Okay. Uh, now there in the additional quiver in Q prime, we also have maps uh, from new vertices to old vertices. And these are denoted by i. Well, I apologize, i also denotes the, the vertices. But this is Nakajima's notation. I can do nothing about it. Uh, I, I cannot change. I think Nakajima uses bold face, but uh, I, I'm unable to produce it on, on the board. Uh, but in the doubled of this, so remember, we take a Q prime doubled. So we also have uh, edges in the reverse direction corresponding to these i's. And these are denoted by j's, again, according to Nakajima. So the whole thing is a, is, a two, is a quadruple, but each element of the quadruple is itself uh, labeled by here by edges and here by vertices. So there's a lot of things. OK. Uh, yes, I, I didn't say how the moment map looks like. Uh, so without double quiver, uh, so without, so the moment map, new, so without additional things, I just said it was uh, like commutators x, x star. Now, if you have i's and j's, uh, well, you can figure out what could it be. Remember that the, league, the group is not changed. So the target has to be the same as before. You don't enlarge the group. So you have to do something with additional i and j. And if you look at this picture, 
if you want to end up with a linear ma with a, an element in here, so you put all these brackets already, so, uh, so also have i and j coming out and into this vertex, and you have to cook up something with, uh, with them, and there's only one thing you can do, you can go out and then come back, and wh which is denoted by a ji, right? So the, the moment map looks like this. Uh, no, the other way. I goes in, I, I is in incoming, and j is outgoing. So this is how the moment map looks like. OK, and finally, before I, uh, so the fiber of the moment map is the pre-image is uh, given by an equation that this is g uh, equal to a scalar matrix. And so we, we will introduce the, uh, the following notation. We say mu inverse uh, of lambda is this uh, stable, uh, is the set of, it's the definition. It's the set of elements in the fiber, so x, x star, uh, I j in mu inverse of lambda satisfying the following condition, stability condition, that if uh, uh, so for any uh, collection uh, su of subspaces v prime sitting in v, uh, such that uh, they contain the image of i's, so i sends each space at an additional vertex into the old space, so the, this map has an image, such that uh, V prime contains the image of I, and V prime is stable under all X's and X stars, and uh, V prime is X, X star stable, uh, yes. Then it must be V, so there are no proper subspaces which contain the image of I and are stable under the, all the maps. So this is the set. Uh, okay, and now what Hilbert Mumford tells me is the following theorem that, so I apologize, I, uh, I will have to uh, uh, split it into two boards. So the first uh, part is that this set is actually smooth. So mu inverse lambda S is smooth for any lambda. Second, the group G V acts freely on this set, acts on uh, mu of lambda S freely. And so the quotient uh, is defined just uh, very naively. Uh, and uh, so then one has the following additional information. Uh, right. Yes, so two, uh, this uh, proj construction, so there, uh, this uh, proj construction, which is in our sense denoted by M lambda, oh, sorry, I did not see. Uh, I forgot one thing. So, rem so from now on, Uh, I will restrict uh, to one, so chi will be one single character. Namely, remember, chi controls the powers of the determinant. I just take the first power. So it's a product of determinants over each, at each vertex. I don't take higher powers or negative. So actually, higher powers doesn't matter. What matters is what is the sign of the determinant. So from now on, I take, I take chi, i to be one for each, uh, for each i. In other words, my chi uh, sends uh, an I tuple of matrices to the product of determinants and without any powers. Okay, so uh, the theorem I'm stating is uh, with this assumption. So chi will disappear. I will no longer write it anywhere. There's just lambda. So this is my Nakajima variety uh, BW. So it is indeed uh, just the naive quotient of the stable locus mod G. So uh, this is the first thing, and uh, so this is the second thing, and the third thing for uh, lambda generic, well, general enough, uh, uh, 
Uh, this is affine. Well, uh, how should I say? Let me let me see it later, a little bit later. So so this is a theorem. Uh, well, I called it a theorem, but actually the proof is very easy. I won't write it down. There's nothing from what we know. It's already. So uh, there's one more uh, thing will be which uh, will be important in a second. Now uh, I used. Uh, this, so now I do use a stability condition, namely uh, this character. But there is a one more, even more naive thing I can do. I can use the character which is one. Not the determinants in power one, but just literally one. No determinants at all. Which corresponds to the categorical quotient. Okay? So uh, I can also consider the variety. So can also, also consider uh, the variety mu inverse of lambda without any stability, just all fiber, and then double slash GV, and this is categorical quotient, so there's no uh, stability at all. So this corresponds to chi equal to zero. Okay? So this is an affine variety in general. We take, like, I mean, this is an affine subvariety in some vector space. We take a categorical quotient by a reductive group. This is an affine variety, but it may be very singular. Unlike this one, which is smooth by, uh, well, I said this is smooth. This is a free action, so the quotient is smooth. So this is smooth, but not affine in general. And this is affine, but singular. And uh, as I said, there's an, in general, there's a, whenever you take a GIT quotient and a categorical quotient, there's a map between them. So there's a map pi from uh, the categorical quotient from the GIT quotient uh, to the categorical quotient. And the, uh, the categorical quotient, I will denote it by m bar lambda of Vw. And so this pi is a projective morphism. So somehow it's, uh, it looks like a contraction. You have a smooth space, and you contract it certain things. And, and this space is not affine. You contract it so it becomes affine. But then, of course, when you contract, it, it may become very singular. Uh, and then, uh, so the next, uh, so maybe, I don't know, remark or separate uh, statement is that, in fact, for lambda generic, this is an isomorphism. In other words, so for lambda generic, general enough, uh, pi is an isomorphism. And this is uh, obvious somehow. So uh, for the following reason. So what is mu? It's a map from one vector space to another vector space. One vector space is a bunch of homes from vector spaces, and the other is the Lie algebra dual, which is also a vector space. So the generic fiber of a map morphism between two smooth varieties is smooth. Uh, uh, so the, for, generic, uh, for general enough lambda, the fiber is already smooth. You don't have to do anything with it. But also, it's a fact about the moment map. Whenever the fiber of the moment map is smooth, the action is automatically uh, free. These two things are equivalent. It's a sp special feature of symplectic geometry. So for generically, uh, I mean, the action is already free. So this S doesn't really, you can put S, but it's the whole thing. So, so this, is, uh, this is obvious. All right, so I have uh, five minutes. I, I really wanted to prove one theorem, so let me prove it. Okay, uh, so, uh, right. so the theorem I wanted to prove says that this map is automatically semi-small. It's a non-trivial statement. So theorem. Uh, the map pi is semi-small in the sense of goretzky mcpherson Now, I will uh, so prove. Well, first of all, definition. Now, definition, so, well, I just write IE. Uh, now, what you have to do, you have to, whenever you have a map from one thing to the another, you can take the fiber product of the space on top over the bottom twice. So we take M. Uh, so my V and W will be fixed throughout, so I won't write them, over M bar, M. Uh, and uh, 
the requirement is that the dimension of the space uh, is no bigger than the dimension of M itself. Now, it, it's actually, it cannot be a smaller because it contains the diagonal of M. So in fact, no bigger means equal. But this game maybe may have several components. It need not be uh, irreducible or anything. So, so this is a condition. And one, uh, so this is the beginning of the proof. Uh, 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 first of all, there's a sort of much more fancy way to reformulate this statement. Uh, so reformulation, so pi, again, it's general. It has nothing to do with curve varieties. So pi is semi-small. Uh, if and only if the following holds, you can look at the constant sheaf on the top thing on M lambda and take its push down under the map pi. And also, there's a standard normalization. You have to shift it in homological degree by the dimension of M lambda. And pi is semi small if and only if this gadget is a perverse sheaf. It's again, it's more or less definition. If you look at the definitions of what perverse sheaf is, it's a certain bound on cohomology. And if you count how to find, actually compute the dimension of this, it will be the same. So it's perverse. OK. So now I will prove that it is indeed perverse. And since I only have two minutes, uh, I will have to uh, explain it in two minutes. Uh, so this, so I'll just draw a diagram and then write a, a, a chain of equations. So what we do is the following. So, uh, so I remind you, so we have this parameter lambda. So where does this parameter live? It lives in C to the I. Now, uh, to make things uh, at least fit into the standard setting, I choose a, a generic line in this C to the I through the origin. Okay. So actually, I will be interested in a line, which is just C, uh, generic enough, uh, through the origin. Yes, and I will prove the theorem for lambda equal to 0 the general case is exactly the same. Uh, it just makes me my notation easier. So uh, generic line uh, through uh, zero. Okay. So my lambda will sit, uh, will run over this line, and then I have the following diagram. On one hand, I have so I'm improving the theorem for zero. So I will have my m uh, zero. This maps to m zero bar. And I want to show that the direct image of constant sheaf here is perverse here. That's what I want to do. Now I put it in a family. So now I take the inverse image of the whole line rather than a single point. And again, uh, take a GIT quotient or whatever. Or, uh, to, so I, well, the same as I did for Nakajima variety, except that I take a whole line rather than a single point. So GV. OK, so uh, here I have whatever I have. Similar thing with chi equal to 0. So let me uh, maybe write this as m tilde. And this is no, maybe just m without any uh, lambda. So let me call this m. Uh, and let, then the corresponding thing here will be uh, m bar. And then the, so this is closed in here because this corresponds to, yes. So this maps to L, my line. This maps to 0 in this line. So this is my pi. Uh, and this is my uh, just point, map to a point. Uh, and this is what happens over L. Uh, and I have a complement, so complement on 0 in L. So this is C star inside here. This is an open embedding. And let me write M, put the nodes to, to indicate that I'm on the complement. So this is an open set. M not here, and this is an open set with a bar in here. So this is a standard diagra diagram for a family parameterized by a line. OK, okay. so now I write uh, the following equations. Since I'm on negative time, I will just write them down. So the, the point is that I'm losing, using 
the functor of nearby cycles and the fact that the functor of nearby cycles takes perverse sheaves to perverse sheaves. And then I just end up with the following chain of equations. Uh, to make it correct, let me write it down. So uh, I will use, uh, I need some notation. So let me write pi nod for the maps. Everything on this column is denoted by nod. Uh, now the function here, which projects to, to the parameter space is f. And the gen uh, everything that happens over the complement of zero, I will denote by eta, which is called usually in algebraic geometry means genetic point. So this will be pi sub eta. And this will be f sub eta. I don't know. OK? Uh, and so now I write the following chain of equations. Uh, I, what, I, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in pi naught, uh, direct image of the constant shift. I will ignore all the shifts. Uh, you can put them in, uh, of m naught. And I want to, this to be perverse. Okay. Now, first of all, I rewrite it. I looked. I look at the function, at the composite map from here to here. So this is my pi without any subscript. It's just all the whole family. And so I can write it as, so I take a look at the sheaf C, uh, M, on the whole thing. Well, actually on the open set. Okay. And whenever I have a sheaf on the open set uh, and the function uh, of, the, of the whole thing so that the open set is the pre-image of C star, I can take nearby cycles of the sheaf here to the special fiber with respect to my function. So I'm taking psi of f uh, composed with pi. And this equality holds uh, because this is a smooth family. And so they, it, it's completely smooth. They all, it's a very nice family. Nothing happens. So, they, uh, so nearby cycle means just restriction in this situation. Nothing happens. OK. On the other hand, uh, I have base change for nearby cycles. So instead of taking nearby cycles and going down, I can first go down and then take nearby cycles. And I am taking base change with respect to pi, which is a proper map. So everything is fine. And so I can write it as, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot. So this gives me the constant sheaf here. I still have to push it down. So. Okay, so I take psi and then push down. Now I can switch this two things. So I can f first push down and then, uh, and now I'm sitting on, on the open set. So when I push down, I take pi eta lower star of C M naught. Okay, so I'm ending up in here. And then I take psi to go here. Okay. And now mir the miracle is that since my line was generic, uh, the, the, the every point in here, which is not zero, is, is also general. But over a general point, uh, these ma this map is an isomorphism. So the push, down, push forward of the constant sheaf is a constant. I mean, both varieties are just smooth and the same. So uh, this guy here is simply the constant sheaf on a smooth manifold. So when I take, so this is just psi f of c of, I put, I, I put a bar, but this bar is just uh, nothing. It's, it doesn't change anything. Uh, uh. So this is a constant sheaf on, on a smooth manifold. It's a perverse sheaf up to all these shifts. So this is psi of a perverse sheaf, so it's perverse. OK, I'm sorry for negative minutes. Well, this is not the original proof. So two comments. This is not the original proof of Nakajima. And second, the same proof word for word works for any symplectic resolution. This is what uh, Prof. Nick will explain tomorrow. Well, this is what he will not explain tomorrow, but, uh, uh, but in any case. Just keep in mind that this works for any symplectic resolution. OK.